Welcome back to Applied Mathematics. In this video, we're going to be reducing rationals. Okay. Before we can do that, I guess I have to get my head out of the way and go into what is a rational. The simplest definition, a rational expression is formed by dividing two polynomials. All right, so we've got polynomials. We've got something like x squared plus 3x plus 2. And we've got something like, you know, 6x plus 12, and we're dividing them. And as soon as we see that written out, uh, we're dividing them. That means that we have all of the work of fractions combined with all of the work of polynomials. A rational expression is a fraction that has polynomials instead of numbers. So the big picture of working with a rational is going to be all of the rules of working with a fraction. The first rule that you ever learned in working with a fraction was that you can reduce a fraction by eliminating common factors between the numerator and denominator. If we look at an example like 12 over 21, you probably would write this just the solution without writing the intermediate step, but hopefully you remember from a previous mathematics course that you would factor this. You would write 12 as 3 times 4. You would write 21 as 3 times 7. You would recognize that there is a common factor of 3 in the numerator and denominator. You would cancel those things out, and you would be left with 4 over 7. I'm going to do the same thing to my rational x squared plus 3x plus 2 over 6x plus 12. In the numerator, we have a quadratic trinomial. We can factor a quadratic trinomial using the AC approach. This one is kind of easy mode, right? The lead coefficient is 1. So I'm looking for two numbers that multiply to 2 and add to 3. x plus 2 and x plus 1. If you're not confident, you can go off to the side. You can write that out in more detail. Uh, you can always double check, multiply it back out, make sure you are getting back to the place that you started. Those are certainly good ideas. But for the sake of trying to fit as much on the screen as I can, I'm not going to go through the details of those. The denominator is a little bit easier, but at the same time less obvious. We have 6x plus 12. It's a linear polynomial, which doesn't have a lot that you can do to factor it. But I do notice that the constant in the two terms, 6 and 12, are both multiples of 6. So maybe I'll factor out the constant factor of 6. When I do, it leaves behind x plus 2. There is now a common factor of x plus 2 between the numerator and the denominator. We can cancel that out, just like we canceled out the 3 in the other problem. Once I have done that, I can write this solution as x plus 1 over 6. And for our purposes in this course, x plus 1 over 6 is a perfectly fine, perfectly valid way of writing out the solution. As we move onward, we will every now and then come across places where it would be nice to expand that out a little bit. 
right? So some of the rules of working with fractions, you can split a fraction up over addition in the numerator. So I could rewrite this as x over 6 plus 1 over 6. And if I really wanted to, x over 6 is the same thing as 1 6 x. Again, you don't need to do any of that for our purposes in this problem. We may come across some things a little bit later in the course where that sort of reasoning makes life easier. And of course, as always, answers in the back of the book are generally written in the way that makes it as difficult as possible to compare them. I'm not sure why that is a trend in educational resources, but it really is. And so recognizing that you could write this solution in any one of these three forms, and it is the same solution, is an important step towards being able to work with problem solving. All right. Let's take a look at another example. x plus 2 over x squared plus 4. In a lot of ways, this is an easier example than the first one we looked at, but in one crucial way, it is a place where students tend to get confused. It actually is easier than the last one we looked at. There's nothing weird or out of the ordinary that is going to happen here, but because I so often run across students who try to make it out of the ordinary, I wanted to make sure I went through it. The numerator in this case cannot factor at all. x plus 2 just stays as x plus 2. The denominator in this case is the difference of two perfect squares. So it will factor to x plus 2 times x minus 2. The x plus 2's cancel each other out, getting rid of everything from the numerator. You can't just make a numerator disappear, though. The numerator has to be there. You have to divide by, or something, by x minus 2. And so the rule of thumb there is that you can always take anything and multiply it by 1 without changing it. So this is 1 over x minus 2. Comparing that quickly, if I had this in the other order, x squared minus 4 over x plus 2, we would factor the same way. x plus 2 times x minus 2 over x plus 2. And I would also write that as multiplied by 1 so that when the x plus 2's cancel each other out, we are left with x minus 2 over 1. Now, in this case, there is a little bit more we can do. Right? 1 divided by a number will give you any of the fractional values that you might end up with. Some number divided by 1, on the other hand, is always the starting value. This is the direction, excuse me, this is the direction where the identity property of 1 actually works. x minus 2 over 1 is just x minus 2. The reason that this is a tricky spot is because in almost any resource that you come across, the algebra would be written out like that instead. The fact that over here, when you canceled out everything in the numerator, you still need a numerator. You still need 1 
over x minus 2. And over here, when you cancel out everything in the denominator, the denominator goes away. Right? This is something that you saw when you were learning how to deal with fractions of numbers. And it hasn't changed. It's the property of 1. 1 divided by some number gives you a fractional value. Some number divided by 1 gives you the number you started with. Unlike multiplication, the order matters in division. All right. One more example. Twelve minus four x over x squared minus nine. This is an interesting one because of the subtraction. In the numerator, factoring this polynomial is fairly straightforward. There's a common factor of 4, and when we get rid of that, it leaves behind 3 minus x. In the denominator, we have the difference of two perfect squares. So that's going to factor to x plus 3 times x minus, not minus 9, x minus 3. And we are so close to being able to cancel something out. Right? We've got a 3 minus x, we've got an x minus 3. It's the same numbers, it's subtraction, but the order has changed. This is one where I'm not going to write out the details. A lot of textbooks try to explain this out as factoring a negative 1, and that is something that we have talked about before. But instead, I want to explain this using an example, using just some numbers. Let's say that x is 7. Mm, not 7. 7 conflicts too much with what we already have going on. Let's say that x is 5. Right, so if we have 3 minus 5, we're going to end up with negative 2. And if we have 5 minus 3, we're going to end up with positive 2. Right, negative 2 in the numerator, positive 2 in the denominator. Let's say that x is 2. Well, then we'll have 3 minus 2, which is 1 in the numerator, and we'll have 1 minus 3, I'm sorry, 2 minus 3, which is negative 1 in the denominator. Which one is which between positive and negative is going to change. But when you're subtracting two numbers and you change the order of subtraction, you get the same magnitude and opposite sign. So when we divide these things, they are going to cancel each other out, but somewhere in the numerator or the denominator, it doesn't actually matter where, you're going to be left with a factor of negative 1. So I can just throw in that factor of negative 1 and everything will be fine. Choosing where to put that factor of negative 1 is sometimes trickier than it would seem. Right, so I'm going to leave this as uh, negative 4 over x plus 3. I think I had said this was going to be the last example, but I do need to talk about a little bit more of trickery that can happen with negative numbers and exactly this behavior. So let's clear that one off of the screen, and let's look at a different solution. Right? There's no factoring to be done, there's no reducing to be done. Negative 2 over x minus 7. This is a fraction that has been reduced as far as possible. But most mathematicians looking at this are going to say that this is not the ideal way of writing the solution because it uses more symbols than it needs to. Very often, if you're working through uh, a derivation like this, if you're working through this sort of problem and you check your answer in the back of the book, you are instead going to see 2 over 7 minus x. What happened here? Well, to go between these, 
in either direction. Multiply the numerator and the denominator of the fraction by negative 1. If you multiply negative 2 by negative 1, you get positive 2. If you multiply positive 2 by negative 1, you get negative 2. So that explains the numerator, no problem. The denominator is a little bit trickier, but it relies on what I was just talking about. If you uh, multiply x minus 7 times negative 1, you're going to change the sign but keep the magnitude of whatever you got. If you switch the order of subtraction from x minus 7 to 7 minus x, you are going to change the sign but keep the magnitude. It's another way of writing the same operation. If it makes you more comfortable, you can write this out. Negative 1 times x minus 7 is the opposite of x plus 7, which is the same thing as 7 plus the opposite of x, which is the same thing as 7 minus x. I don't think that writing that out is helpful, but if you think it's helpful, go for it. There's nothing wrong with it, certainly. Moral of the story, when you're working with rational expressions and you're trying to reduce the rational to simplify the expression, there are a lot of very straightforward tools. Right? Reducing a fraction is something that you've been doing since well before this course. Factoring polynomials is something that we've become fairly, com fairly comfortable with, so nothing new there. And really the only thing that there is to talk about is all of these little tricks where uh, exercise writers, problem set writers, try to make things look more difficult than they really are. Right? If you take your time and you pay attention, uh, it's really nothing to worry about. That's all I have for this video. It's a lot more abstract than I like to do for, these, uh, for this course, but unfortunately, uh, as I talked about previously, this is really a building block type of lesson. Once we have this mastered, we're going to be able to take it to solve a number of problems that we couldn't before. But for right now, it's just basic skill building. As always, thank you for joining me, and I'll see you in the next one.